first attraction. Yeah. <laughs> they were the people. <laughs> yeah, my people. I can't do it. Yeah, you don't want to do it. I'm pulling on the door. They, they are not locked. Oh, oh, they're safety latches. They're really not going to be able to hold your full body weight. Be careful. This is around right camera. Now, I know we're not stopping here at the very beginning. We'll circle back around to explore all of this towards the end of our journey. We do have some really cool birds off to the right side, though. Slow down a little bit. We've got some waddled cranes moving around. By what looks like a cookie and mess. In development, there are some European storks with black and white feathers, but beyond all that are native species of birds, North American white pelicans, darker birds, like coots and mornings and cormorants and ibis and oh my, lots of birds out there. Their next door neighbors, all huddled in the front most corner of their exhibit, are the greater flamingos. So lots of birds to look forward to. Any of the native species of birds that are Birds like the wattled cranes, European storks, the greater flamingos, any of those birds that are not native to this particular part of the world, typically have a one-time procedure done when they're very young. It's called pinioning that will prevent them from flying away and causing mischief in the native habitat that's around them. But normally, yeah, birds will fly a lot of times to escape danger, to migrate to their safe nesting grounds, to find roosting spots, to find food and shelter. That form of locomotion is very efficient for them. They can travel great distances. And it's just one of many adaptations. As we head out into our version of the wilds of Africa, we look for about 50 different species of mammals and birds. We'll talk more about those adaptations. How would they survive? Now, this next species on the right side as well, they don't fly. But... The second largest <laughs> mammal. Mine, second only to African elephants. They are the southern white rhinos. So why do the wide rhinos? They're basically boulders on legs. Six girls That's in the rhino resting center. Six girls. Wow. So what is that all about? Rhino <laughs> rescue <laughs> center. Well, here at the safari <laughs> park. The majority of our conservation work that happens on ground centers around breeding behavior, reproduction. And we've been doing things we say the old fashioned way for several years, decades. But as rhinos are facing one of the biggest threats to their existence in more modern times, they do kind of research, actually, in illegal hunting that they face poaching activities. About three to four rhinos are killed every single day in Africa alone, on average. And it's mostly for their horns that are still widely used 
in many traditional medicines with a belief that it will cure everything from a fever to cancer. Even though studies have shown that rhino horn is actually made of the same stuff as the bird feathers we just saw. And your hair and your fingernails is all made of keratin protein. That's all it is. But the belief that drives this consumer demand for their horn is pretty high. So what we're doing at the Rhino Rescue Center is now looking at scientific reproductive methods to help them out as much as we can. Two of those six girls have been confirmed pregnant through artificial insemination, which is really difficult to do for Rhino. There's a lot more happening than just kind of overview. If you ever want to learn more about it, what rhinos are facing and our conservation work and how we're trying to help them uh, at the Rhino Rescue Center, there's a website there that you can always check out. It's a really good website. But yeah, so we, we focus on reproduction and providing these animals a more natural environment so they have this home feeling, like an island to the left, where there are support birds. These are actually part of our our collection, if you will. They are the great white pelicans, those are the big white ones, and the Dalmatian pelicans that are a little bit more gray in color, all of them sleeping on the island. Sleeping in the <laughs> and then to the left of all of that are some water bugs walking away from the water. <laughs> So that's in their name, that's typically what it can be found in the water. <laughs> you, can just, you can aim there and it'll go all around anyway. Yeah, you can just aim right there, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Wet. They don't like the water so much. They don't like to get in the water. Try to keep going. Now beyond this pond is about 60 acres for one enclosure. This will be the main exhibit that we are looking into for the majority of the tour. There will be animals on both sides throughout our journey. And with about 50 different species and a lot of information to get out, we're going to do more than just name that species on this tour. Like I said, we're going to talk about the Zeta species and how they survive, touch on some of the challenges that they have been facing and ways that we are trying to help. Conservation work outside of our okay, brain program. So that being said, I may not be able to talk about every single thing out here. I will probably skip over some of them just for timing purposes, or I may not talk about something as much as you're hoping. So if that happens, if you have questions, those are more than welcome at the end of the tour. I'll do my best. So. Since we tried, you know, to recreate their natural environments. We have the semi-deserts and savannas on the left side of marsh habitat off to the right. Some more sleepy birds. The national symbol of South Africa is the bird of South Africa. It's just to the right and behind that person. Yeah. It's a replica skeleton. Those are blue cranes. African yeah. screenbill, yellow-billed stork, sacred ibis. So it looks like an Oreo cookie. <laughs> Multi-species exhibits. All these birds could be interacting with each other if they wanted to. Most of the time, they don't like to be for each other. That's okay. That's their choice. There's still a certain safety in numbers, even if you're not of the same species. You can come together, and join forces. So the more eyes, ears, and noses that you have looking out for you, the better your chance of surviving. And then, of course, being able to help find your survivor traits, whatever they are, to the next generation. So we have a lot of antelope to be found in our savannas of Africa on the left side of the trail. So we already saw the elixin water bucks, those are the ones walking away from the water. A little bit further up the hill, though, to the fork in the road. But inside the exhibit, rather large tan antelope. Those are eland, Patterson's and common eland. Even though they're not necessarily an endangered species, they do face challenges in certain areas that have affected their populations. Things like habitat loss, losing their home range for various different reasons. So we still have a breeding program here. Same goes for the springbok antelope. Even tiny things out there, they're full grown, but they're just small. This is also just in case scenario, just in case anything should affect their population suddenly, drastically, maybe disease or famine. 
or to drive their numbers down. We have healthy reserve herds to build them back up. We want to make sure they are as healthy as possible. So, all of the the giraffes are ahead of us, rhinos, they're all part of something called the survival plan, which for them is very similar to an online seasonal service of sorts, except they get access to each other based on their genetic availability. So the romance of it all for the sable antelope. We do have a baby sable antelope in this herd. Kind of a cinnamon brown on the far left side of the group. That is all lying down. Now even though they're lying down, they're not really as the baby's asleep, but that's okay. Baby's surrounded by the adults, surrounded by the bodyguards. But the bodyguards, they have to be awake. <laughs> They're resting, they're conserving Good. energy, but they're still awake, they're still alert, and they're still looking all around. Yeah. Quite literally, all around. Everybody's facing on different directions. <coughs> it's great if you have a lot of eyes, but if you're all facing the same direction, predators sneak up from behind you, then you're all lunch. That's just a bad thing. Even the giraffes do that when they lie down. There are two young female giraffes lying down back to back. Just beyond this smaller enclosure, past the the dirt road that is inside the exhibit is two young Maasai giraffes. This group came here from a different zoo. We have an adult female who's at the feeding post here. Her name is Jasira. She's here on breeding loan from Canada. And that's actually, I think that's her daughter behind her. Also sitting down. Now, when you do see giraffes, Sitting on the ground like this. No, no, I'm talking about right. This is a good day. This means no, they're comfortable, they're relaxed enough to hmm. put themselves low to the ground. There's no immediate ears danger or threat. How many ears does he have? This is good. Mm -hmm. But if they were to stand up suddenly and take off running, all the other animals in this area would take off running with them. They may not know why they're running, but they don't want to stick around to find out. The eyesight of the giraffe is amazing. I to see that. Yeah. Coupled with their height, they have been known to see things from see about a mile Tell away. So yeah, good to have a giraffe. Mm -hmm. This is Robert, oh, watch it. Oh, watch adult it. male giraffe. He's actually up here from the San Diego Zoo. Yeah, 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 yeah. And for the most part, as long as there's enough food and water and shelter and space, everybody gets along, like I said, just well enough to ignore each other. Not everybody. Just that. Some of them don't play well with others. Oh, there's the right side of the trail. Oh, wow, that one has like a weird growth on this tummy. Active. There's a herd of wild equids. You might see them maybe under the trees, gathered around the food. They are native to Somalia. They are the Somali wild ants. Yes. That's three. Not a donkey. They might be predators of our domesticated donkeys, but they are wild equids. And in their native home range, they have learned to be extra competitive over resources. Since they don't digest their food very efficiently, the food goes in one end, and it eventually comes out the other end, but not a lot of nutrition is absorbed in the middle of all of that. So they have to eat a lot just to get enough. And they don't like to share. They start biting, they start kicking, they start guarding their resources. If they lived in a multi-species of it would be really, really stressful yeah. for them. Bigger than a donkey, that's okay. Oh, I see that. There could be unnecessary injuries with their competitive nature, so we just give them their own room. This is a luxury lifestyle for them, though. Their wild counterparts don't have that. <coughs> they still have competition <coughs> more often from domesticated livestock. So we partnered with a couple of organizations. One is called the Northern Rangelands Trust, and they do many things. Sometimes starting with education around herd management and land management as well. As we leave behind the savannas, we're going to go further uphill, yep. passing by a couple of small enclosures down to the left of us. And one of them you might see as we pass her by. She's taking a nap, so we'll just keep moving on. But there was a rhinoceros napping in the sunshine. She's an older girl. Her name is Lembe. She's getting some alone time. <laughs> but there are any number of reasons we'll bring animals into those small bomas. <laughs> That's what he worked for, animal enclosure. And it could be to separate them for a medical procedure. They need a vet checkup. It's easier to do that in a smaller room. 
If they are new to the safari park, they might need time to get used to the different sights and sounds and smells around them. So, many different reasons. We've got some activity on the left side. <laughs> some uh, fire crews out there clearing out some of the brush around the park. Always, always, always having to think about that here. We have native habitat that surrounds us right now. Take care of the park, you know. Fires in the park. But it's not normal activity that happens every single day. So the antelope that are up here are keeping a watchful eye on those humans. And those at the very top of the hill are called roan antelope. <laughs> Some little gazelle off to the right side of the tram as well. Little red <coughs> gazelle. Little guys over so yes, they're going to keep an eye on this unusual activity, but they're not running away in panic. They don't need to. This is exactly how they would behave toward any potential threat or predator in their native home range, too. They just watch it. But, um, I'm not going to run unless I feel it's absolutely necessary. I'm not going to waste the energy unless you make me. Some of them don't even care, do they? They're just sleeping. Oh, the innocence of youth. Usually it's the little ones, right? The babies. They gotta grow, they have to grow. And it takes a lot of energy, so they're often the ones that will sleep more as so long as they have their bodyguards looking out for them. You can see how close it is to our exhibit areas. So if there were wildfires that should, for whatever reason, make their way here, we're always having to, you know, be cautious of that. There are plans in place if that should happen. But even though this native habitat, some of these plants actually do depend on wildfires to come back, basically. We have such a high frequency of wildfires that now the concern is uh, invasive grasses taking over the scrub brush. And that is a concern. This native scrub brush, California scrub brush, is some of the most endangered habitat in North America. There are such a variety of plants and animals in one location is considered one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. No, it's my bone in my hair! <laughs> so the 18 no, acres that make up the safari park, half of that is developed on purpose. We wanted to make sure that those plants and animals that live right here in our own backyard have a place to call home for as long as possible. So from California to the mountains of northern Africa. Down below, there's a fenced off portion of the hillside, and if you look very closely, you might see some of the animals that live on that hillside. Maybe you see a couple of them in the shadows, the shade of that big tall tree halfway up the hill. Maybe you see one or two of them moving around underneath a dark green leafy tree, or maybe you see others in different locations. They are the Barbary sheep. But if you don't see them at first, that's okay because they're camouflaged. Ha ha. <laughs> Hi. Their body color is the same color as the background, that hillside that they're on. So when they're not moving, they're camouflaged. They disappear. It's really effective. You're right. <laughs> but they do get their own room, mostly because of their there we go. There you go. adaptation. They are just much better. Oh my God, you in my you're in my slide room. You're in my slide room. Mm. Their hose grip the rocks. You good guy. Uh, so they don't fall down. Now that we're back in the open, we'll go from Mount 
I come back. Oh, my <laughs> to the of the dirt road that goes kind of straight through this exhibit. There are maybe some familiar faces. Those that are mass migrations. Traveling across the Serengetis. Could be over a million of them in one herd. They are the wildebeest. Now, obviously, we don't have the space or resources to have a million little beasts here, so this is a little sample size herd. Yeah. And if you have a million mouths to feed, you kind of have to keep moving around just to find enough food for all those mouths. If you don't have as many mouths, you don't have as much to worry about, you can stay in one place for a little bit longer. It's not unusual for them to just stay in one spot throughout the day. Oh, yeah. There's plenty of them. Yeah. Or maybe you have to migrate because there's not a lot of food. You have to go wherever it is. You live in a desert habitat off to the right side of the train. This is a car for these are the mountains. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
better for them to have friends, coalition partners. There are several adult females looking out for even one or two babies. They could be more, more better, more better. That's, that's good. Yeah, more successfully uh, protect those babies. Now keep in mind with the mammals, especially the females are the ones with the task, the job, the responsibility of taking care of the, the babies. They are the ones that provide the food. Males don't necessarily have a role in that. So the male, I think this is our adult male here. The, nope, this is one of the aunties. Um, oh, this is Demisha. Yeah, she's like a freelance auntie. She'll just, you know, help whoever needs it. <laughs> She'll hang out whoever, with whoever needs or wants her company. Yeah. But see, now, when the male is courting any of the females that are in estrus, he not only has to sweet-talk her, he has to sweet-talk all of her coalition partners, all of her girlfriends. Yeah. So he has to be very respectful to all the females. And, of course, we have the reticulated giraffe as well. Some of them are on the caravan safari. The only tour that gives you that experience, by the way. If you want to learn more about any of the other safaris, caravan safari, cart safaris, anything else, there is a ticket booth that's right across from the train station. It can give you much more information about the times that these tours go out, the availability, seats available, pricing, anything like that. Now the only exhibits the caravans do not drive in, for good reason, would be the predators. You know, Self-explanatory there. But there are lions that are on exhibit to the right side of the tram, just as we come past some of these trees. We may or may not see them on the, oh, they're actually up and awake. Uh -huh, how about that? That's unusual. That doesn't happen every day. There you go. Up the lions. If you wanted to, if you wanted to hang out with the lions or go see them better, there is a wooden bridge that goes directly in front of Lion Camp. You can access that on foot once we get back to the tram station. Mm -hmm. yes, so, as we come yes, around full circle, yes, we want to thank you for making us a part of your day. And as you gather up all your personal belongings, we take with you. The exit off the tram will be to the right side. The right side. Thank you.